Kofi Williams and Paula Stroutmane for the tip. And the winner to the Sweet 16. Let's take a look at today's Capital One starting lineups. An excellent balanced attack for UConn all year. That was very much the case in their 140-point performance on Saturday. Nafisa Collier draws a foul off an offensive rebound. And right off the first play, what we see is going to be a challenge for Quinnipiac is handling the interior presence of both Gabby Williams and Nafisa Collier. Boxing out, limiting, limiting to one shot. That's a huge advantage for the Huskies in this one. Trisha Fabry in her 23rd season. The winningest coach in Quinnipiac women's basketball history. Owes a lot to Gino Ariema. We'll talk about that as the night goes on. Quinnipiac did a lot of work against a press in their shoot around earlier today. They're starting five. Jen Fay is their leading scorer. Aaron McClure is their most complete player. Here's Fay. Ties the game. Crystal Dangerfield. This is Carly Fabry, the daughter of Tricia, in her senior campaign. Could be playing her final game for her mother. Well, this is something we're going to see from Quinnipiac throughout the whole game. Let's take the shot clock down, use the clock, limit the possessions that UConn has on the offensive end to try and increase their chances of winning this game. And really nobody going to the offensive glass for Quinnipiac either, as you pointed out during shoot-around. Collier has the first four for UConn. Here's Faye, a quick shot. Danger field to Williams. They talked about the defensive prowess of Gabby Williams, the point of the press, and has the ability to guard positions one through five. We saw a lot of this against Miami, isolating Aaron McClure on one side of the floor. The footwork of Samuelson forced a bad pass. Well, it's the length and the athleticism, that package of UConn defenders that I think is going to be a huge challenge. In the MAC, McClure and Faye have an advantage of some sort. Right. They, they generally are bigger or they're stronger. And now going against these UConn defenders, they're not either. So that's a huge challenge. Samuelson's open. They really collapsed the defense there, and Samuelson had a wide open look. The top five three point shooter in the country this year. Faye needing help. And Edel Thornton goes back door. That's a nice bailout by Thornton to take the pressure, use the aggression of the defense against themselves, and get the back door. Nurse. Still seven to shoot. Danger field. Snatched by McClure, who had a near triple double against Miami in the opening round. Along with that line, she was very strong in the defensive end as well, with three steals and three blocks. Two of those blocks coming in the fourth quarter in a crucial sequence. A triple team on McClure. Two to shoot. 
Faye has to force it up and nearly put it down. Double on Samuelson. Kia Nurse. What a beautiful offense. What a left-handed pass along the baseline by Katie Lou Samuelson. Not her dominant hand, so to fire that across the court, very impressive. Now it's Williams on the court. Shot clock all the way down to five. Fabry. Good roll by Collier and Stroutmane with the foul. A seven point advantage for Gino Ariema's crew early. A spot in the Sweet 16 on the line tonight. Because they didn't look the part. And they just came in and they played their brains out. And I'm not surprised at all. Strisha Fabry took Quinnipiac to the Sweet 16 last season. Wins over Marquette and Miami in Coral Gables for the first two NCAA tournament wins in the Bobcats history. Gino Ariem is speaking about how engaging it was to watch Trisha Fabry do what she did and to watch the Bobcats do what they did a year ago a magical run Oh, he loves the way that they play and this is a, a school that's a little over an hour from Yukon here in stores down in Hamden Connecticut and 55 miles away for so the second time that these two teams are meeting Good feed by McClure to Stroutmane. It feels like Quinnipiac does a good job of taking advantage of aggressive defenses. You pointed that out. Well, listen, Adam, their best possessions have come not in their ISO action. It's come off of attacking, being aggressive, and making plays. And uh, while I know Trisha Fabry wants to slow the game down and limit possessions, this is a team that's at their best when they're attacking on the offensive end. When they're attacking, they call that their cat set. They did a lot more of that in the second half against Miami on Saturday. Five on the shot clock. Gabby Williams with the block on Faye. And a smothering one-on-one -on -one defense for Gabby Williams. Good job by Faye to knock it out. That's what Trisha Fabry wants, right? Make sure our defense is set. Regardless of what happens on the offensive end, set the defense. And she wants to make UConn play in the half court. Not that they can't be successful in the half court, but they're more of a problem in transition. Lafisa Collier. And that's the high low that UConn worked on a ton this morning and shoot around. Utilizing the strength and the advantage that they have with Collier and Williams. It's something we'll see a lot of tonight. Kia Nurse got into the passing lane. Dangerfield with the hesitation. Two on one. McClure blocked by Samuelson. What a play on defense. Collier. Already 10 for Collier. Off to a hot start like she was on Saturday. Faye. Samuelson backs up. Gabby Williams going over the top. An exciting opening weekend and coverage of the Division I Men's Basketball Championship Sweet 16 begins on Thursday. Our friends at CBS and TBS will take care of us. For matchups and game times, you can go to NCAA.com. Sister Jean for life. Loyola Ramblers. I know they knocked off 
the Tennessee Vols, but hard not to root for Sister Jean. Hard not to root for Sister Jean. I, I think Jean there, there, there may be yeah. religious implications if you don't root for Sister Jean, actually, <laughs> now that I realize. <laughs> Paige Werfel and Brittany Martin both in for Quinnipiac. And this is Martin. He got knocked down. Yeah, foul shooting a three-pointer. Talked about at the open how much of a defensive presence Gabby Williams was. And I believe that's her second foul. Just picked up one on the other end of the floor trying to go after a rebound. So in a span of 15 seconds or so, Gabby Williams picked up her second foul. This young lady right here at the free throw line was terrific down the stretch for Quinnipiac in their first round game against Miami. Came off the bench and made some crucial, crucial shots. And I gotta allow her to land. And that's absolutely a foul. Williams, who Gino Ariema said, I would challenge anybody in the country to find someone who makes as many big plays at both ends of the floor as Gabby Williams does. She's gonna come off the floor. Not a bad sub, Azare Stevens coming off one of her best games of the season. We'll check in. Martin makes all three. Azare Stevens played just 15 minutes on Saturday, scored 26 points, a season high, and had 10 rebounds as well. And she wants it. She got the position in the bucket. Yeah, there's the high-low action again. That's yep. Dangerfield with the pinpoint pass. And you got someone that's 6'6", and they're full fronting in the middle of the floor. Put it where only they can get it, where only that 6'6 frame can get to. That's excellent pass placement by Dangerfield. Stevens had one of the most efficient performances of the century in the tournament on Saturday. Nurse squares it. Final minute of the first. Stevens. Good box out by Warfel to take Collier out of it. I was just going to say, I love how physical War Warfel's playing for Quinnipiac. She's somebody you knew coming into the game would have to play some type of role because of how deep uh, UConn, or I should say, how they have those three post players, and she's going to be counted on, and she's done a nice job defensively with her physicality. Wait in the clock. Got to hurry. But a foul is called. Three seconds on the shot clock when Nafisa Collier was called for the foul. So you talk about closing out a quarter, it's something that UConn does better than anybody. If you're Quinnipiac, it's a shot and that's it. That's yeah. what you get. It's nothing coming on the other end. You don't want to go too early. You try to go in either down seven or eight or what it is now for miss 10, but don't give them another possession. There's Stratman in. Warful. That'll be the final shot of the quarter. Collier led the way for UConn. 10 of the night. Here at Quinnipiac. Trisha said that when Gino wore that Quinnipiac shirt last year, it was almost like getting validation for the best coach in the country. And you can tell that there is a significant level of respect between these two teams, coaches, and programs. So you look at the rise of the Quinnipiac program over the last couple seasons. Last year, they go to the Sweet 16. It's their first two wins in the NCAA tournament in the program history. Yeah. And then to come back this year and validate last year's performance with a win in the first round, that says a lot about where this program's headed. Martin has to chuck it up there with the clock winding down. Nineteen points in the first quarter after they set a tournament record with 55 in the first on Saturday. Patricia Fabry at least getting what she wants pace-wise. Samuelson lost it. It's a family affair for the Fabrys. There's Paul Fabry, Trisha's husband, and Carly's father. So I heard a story about Paul and how he asked Trisha to marry him. You got, you got to share this. Trisha played basketball at Fairfield. Yep. 
down near the shore here in Connecticut, and he rode a horse onto the court, Fairfield, a Fairfield, and asked her to marry him. That's how they got engaged. How about that, Paul? Paul night, a knight on the horse. Yes. I love the engagement. It. Come on. A horse onto the basketball court. All right. Do you, can you top that? Your, can, can your engagement story top that or not? I don't, I don't um, say you have to share it, but the, well, the, does it top what Paul did? Mine does not evolve in animal. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that could be a good thing or a bad thing. Who knows? <laughs> Here is McClure with the double. Jen Faye taking it strong to the rim. Nurse. Samuels in the offensive rebound. Stroutmanet's activity was a huge factor on Saturday for Quinnipiac. Well, that's an outstanding defensive play that she makes. We talked about the high-low emphasis for UConn, and what she does is circle the post player and able to get a deflection. That's all you need just to distort the play. Dangerfield's open. I love the physicality Quinnipiac's playing yeah. with on the defensive end. Every shot, they're they're working as hard as they can to box out and try to limit the one shot, and I think that's a big reason why UConn has not scored in the first two minutes of this quarter. Well, they're going to take advantage of this matchup because it's the one matchup where they have a significant size advantage, Faye versus Dangerfield. Dangerfield, the smallest UConn player in the rotation. The clock at two. Stroutmanet, everything but the finish. Three second violation against Azure Stevens. This is an in-state matchup. It's only the third time in the tournament history that UConn has played an in-state team. But when was the last time UConn lost to a team from the state of Connecticut? I'll give you the answer in a little bit. UConn defeated Fairfield in 1998. And also defeated Hartford in 2011. There's Dangerfield. Back to Nurse. For three. Excellent driving kick action. Crystal Dangerfield attacked the closeout. And Quinnipiac, Quinnipiac defensively was in scramble mode. And Nurse does what she's done all season long. That's knock down a three-point shot with great efficiency. That's something Trisha Fabry was worried about. UConn really does spread you wide because of their shooters and the inside presence. It's hard to defend those drops. It's hard, and their spacing is very, very good. I mean, it's something they practice. They put tape down on the practice floor to have the correct spacing. That's a tough finish by Faye with the closeout of Stevens. I mean, they're spacing in practice. They want their players beyond the NBA three-point line yeah. to really put a lot of pressure on you defensively and spread you out. Azaray Stevens battling to the bucket. Stevens, the transfer from Duke in her first year at UConn. A little bit of a different pace than Saturday, partner, huh? Yeah. Walking it up, trying to maximize each possession. Essentially shorten the game. Yep. Stratman in. She could shoot it. That's six feet tall. She knocked down 43% of her three-pointers this year. Collier, in and out, and Stroutmanet with the rebound. She's played very well, Stroutmanet. I mean, she's battling every time down the floor, undersized in every matchup, but has held her own. Can't question her toughness. 
A Riga Latvia native. She's open again. And Warfel is going to get tagged with a foul. Eight point lead for UConn. Parity so far in this women's tournament. Second round action from the Albany region here in scores. UConn with an eight point lead. UConn with an 11 point lead. One of the best in the country. Kia Nurse with her second three. UConn trying to force the issue with a trap early in. Let's see how Quinnipiac navigates without Carly Fabry on the floor, their point guard. Thornton not as comfortable as the lead ball handler on the offensive end. There is Thornton. Faye will get it off. Rattle it in and out. Gabby Williams back on the floor for UConn with those two fouls. And a foul on Strutman A. Her second. An interesting decision here for Trisha yeah. Fabry with 3.44 left. I wonder if we'll see Worf will come in the game. Yeah, she's going to have to come in. You just lose that physicality with Stroudman off and a skilled shooter. Right, you, and I, I think that's what's more important is you lose that spacing on the offensive end. Williams, blocking foul. Luis Gonzalez signals that'll be a shooting foul. Jen Fay picks up her first. First person all, third team foul. In the restricted area as well. well Faye was a little bang, uh, banged up, taking that contact from Gabby Williams. Well, we'll revisit with Maria in just a few minutes with our Northwestern Mutual halftime report. Mention all those double digit seeds that are still alive. Two of them are playing right now. Central Michigan against Ohio State and Buffalo against Florida State. What a performance by the Bulls in the NCAA tournament. The men's team knocked off Arizona. The women's team with its first NCAA tournament victory. And of course, fans of UConn and Quinnipiac are keeping a special eye on that Georgia Duke game. That's right. The winner of this game and that game will play in the Sweet 16 in Albany. We will fill out the other three spots in the Albany region tonight, the next hour and a half or so. Shot clock down to five. A look at the defense from UConn. What a finish by Thornton. It is hard not to love what Edel Thornton has done in the last three games. Stevens with a great seal and finish. See UConn in a zone trying to take away the ISO that Quinnipiac has tried to wear out on that left side of the floor because there's two defenders over there to discourage that. Stroutman in there with those two fouls. Faye will not get it off. Trisha Fabry, though, did tell us that she's okay with a shot clock violation over a, turnover. Over, a, yes. over a live ball turnover. So yeah. UConn can't run out. Allows them to get their defense set and achieves what one of their goals was coming into the game is shortening it. First turnover of this second quarter for the Bobcats. Nice late dump off by Collier to Stevens. Largest lead is 15. Samuelson 
with the reach in. Uh, wait until the last possible moment. Watch three players come up and contest a shot. And that means there's someone open, finds Azare Stevens. Azare's length has been a big advantage for UConn. As Quinnipiac has brought extra defenders in the paint, but nobody on their team can contend with a 6'6 frame. And our camera crew did a great job with that angle. You saw the length of Collier as well to see over those shorter defenders. That's an advantage that Kara's been talking about all night. More of it on display there with two blocks. The floor with a foul. The top shot blocking team in the American Conference this year. Well, 6'6 six, six, and athletic and has the ability to move. And I'll tell you this, if your post player gets two blocks, they better touch it on the first possession. She's her, you better give it to her. Absolutely. Even if she throws it over the backboard, she's going to be mad if you didn't let her touch it. So you got to reward the effort on the defensive end. Katie Lou Samuelson doing right as a perimeter player by her post. Thornton comes out of there with the steal. Fabry settles it down. McClure. I don't know why Faye passed that. She, she needed to look at the basket. Look. Yeah, much better look than McClure had. Passed to a harder shot. Another three-second violation. Good defense that time by the Bobcats. Well, the men's ice hockey tournament skates towards the Frozen Four in St. Paul with the regional semifinals beginning Friday at 3 o'clock Eastern on ESPN2 and the ESPN app. You can visit NCAA.com, the home for all 90 NCAA championships. Quinnipiac was probably best known for its hockey team until this women's basketball program started to make some noise the last five years. Stratmane for three. Shot clock is off. Final seconds. Danger field with the travel. Still three on the clock. Their defense has been pretty good. Yeah. Quinnipiac. Uh, I mean, I know UConn has made a living in the paint with their size. The problem is, is they can't find a way to squeak out enough baskets on the offensive end. That's a credit to UConn defensively. UConn to hold them to just 32 points and a half. This slowed the game down. We'll take a look at who's on the floor. Brought to you by Capital One. Same five that started the game for Connecticut are out there to start the second half. Well, you referenced that UCF game. That is the lowest first half total that UConn has been held to this season. And this game right here, the second lowest with 33 points. And a quick foul on the Fisa Collier per second. That's what Carol was talking about. Just 33 points for UConn. Moving the ball well. When Quinnipiac beat Miami last year in the second round, they hit 15 three-pointers. They hit big three-pointers against Miami on Saturday. They're going to need some big shots from the outside to get back in and stay in this game. They had some quality open looks in the first half from beyond the arc. A couple of them just went in and out. McClure beats the buzzer. That's the perfect Trisha Fabry possession, <laughs> right? Run it 29 all the way seconds down, down yes, and, the and hit the shot. Not just take it, but hit it. Fabry to McClure could not corral it. Right, that would have been something had Quinnipiac been able to cash in. Edel Thornton knocks it out of bounds. 
Fans don't sit down until a bucket goes down for UConn. Not sure if they're used to sitting this long out of the halftime break. A foul on the floor. Start of the second quarter defensively, the start of the third quarter for Quinnipiac has been very impressive. Yeah. Active in help, anticipating where the ball is going to go. Uh, the only the only bad part of that possession there is that McClure fouls at the end, but I thought it was a pretty good defensive possession. And that's the hard part when you're playing against Connecticut. All five players have the ability to make plays. They can find a mismatch. They can take advantage one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and they can also take advantage using each other to get open. And again, there was a high-low that we just talked about. There was a high-low action between Williams and Collier yep. that Nafisa got fouled on. And they put Katie Lou Samuelson with all that length out on the point guard, Carly Fabry. McClure for three. Samuelson with the rebound. Another turnover. Now it's Dangerfield on the guard. And now it's Collier with the switch. All the way down to three of the shot clock. Fourth Thornton had it blocked by Collier. A shot clock violation. Stroutmane did not hit the rim. We asked you guys in the first half, when was the last time UConn lost to an in-state team? You gotta go back to 1983. Trisha Fabry's alma mater. Uh, Trisha was still in high school at this point, but Fairfield had the win in 83 against UConn. That was before Gino Oriema took over at UConn. He was still an assistant coach at Virginia. Gabby Williams has given UConn its largest lead at 16. We were not functioning, I think, at that point. Last time UConn lost to you were not alive. I was well. That I was not functioning. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, some could argue I'm not functioning very well right now. But I, I was two years old. I was clearly functioning. <laughs> Maybe not on all cylinders, but I was functioning. Uh, yeah, you were probably running sprints, <laughs> knocking down, knocking down 21 footers at age two. Granny style, of course. Yes. <laughs> Stroudman in from the baseline knocks it down. She's got seven. Nurse sets up Dangerfield. UConn has not hit a ton of threes, but most of them, in fact, every one of them might have been of the drive and kick variety when they've been able to penetrate, suck in the Bobcat defense, and then kick to an open shooter. Nice offense. We've got 12 assists on 14 field goals. Faye from deep knocks it down. They're going to need a lot more of that in the second half to stay in it. That's the first three for Jen Faye. Nurse draws the contact. Stromine, her third foul. She played some minutes out there with those two fouls, but now with five and a half left in the third, third Trisha Fabry is going to have another potential decision here. I, I thought Stroutman has done a good job in her help side and being there early. I thought she was in pretty good position uh, on, on that play. I think that's exactly what Trisha Fabry was 
talking to Kathy Cornell about. The NCAA Women's Championship presented by Capital One continues later on tonight. Here are the games in our 9 o'clock Eastern time window in the second round. You can check your local listings for the game in your area. And again, if you want to switch to any game that your heart desires to watch, the ESPN app is the perfect tool for you to flip around whenever you want to to check out the best action. So you're saying don't tweet at you when you can't watch the game that you want? I mean, I'll, I'll happily be the punching bag. We don't have any service in Gamble Pavilion, so I won't see him until about 11.30 later on tonight okay. when I get some service. So it's fine if you want to tweet me. I just won't see him. <laughs> McClure, a challenge shot over Nurse. Samuelson. Boy, that is a pro level shot. That's one of my favorite plays that UConn runs. It's just a screen, one of their post players, right in the elbow area, and you either have to decide to switch, and if you don't switch and you're late, Katie Lou with that frame is going to rise and fire, and she's money. That's the biggest strength of her game is her ability to, kn to knock down jump shots. You've talked about it. She doesn't always go hunting for shots. She's only taken four so far in this game. McClure against the smaller danger field. Collier to Nurse, a three. And Nurse has been the beneficiary of some patient offense and some great passing by her teammates. An excellent find by Nafisa Collier to be patient, know that there's multiple defenders in the paint, know that there's a teammate open on the weak side. She doesn't let her teammate talk her into a turnover. She stays patient and understands that when she spins back, that's going to create the alley to get the, to get the open shot. It's just a great offensive play by the Huskies. So you're saying that if... Collier hears Nurse and tries to force the pass too early. That could be a turnover because she was patient and let Kia Nurse step over. That was an open passing lane for her to throw to. Yeah, there's no angle. There was no angle. So it was an excellent job. So Kia Nurse and Darnell, the excellent player for the Edmonton Oilers from Hamilton, Ontario. Kia Nurse on cue. What a career she's had. An incredible run along with Gabby Williams. And she waited. She waited behind Brianna Stewart, behind Mariah Jefferson, behind Morgan Tuck. She had to wait her turn to be a starter and true impact player for this UConn team. And she's been a starter most of her career. But waited patiently behind those two players and then put up career numbers a year ago. And has been fabulous this year at both ends again. I love her consistency. You know, she's she's so steady for this team. And uh, her defensive play this season has been the most impressive thing to me. I mean, I know she's shot the ball very efficiently from beyond the arc, yep. but consistently when we've done UConn games this year, Gina Oriama has put Kia Nurse on the best perimeter player on the other team. Yep. And has trusted, hasn't had to bring extra people. She's been able to handle them herself. Every time we've seen UConn, kind of typically it's been a big game, whether it's been a conference tournament game or against a high-level out-of-conference opponent. She's on the stud. Mm -hmm. I mean, she went after Asia Durr when one of the best players in the country came to Gamble Pavilion in February. UConn now has its largest lead at 21 points. Carly Fabry making it tough on Crystal Dangerfield. Fabry is potentially playing her final game for Quinnipiac and for her mother, Tricia. But she's going to be around the program. She is in a six-year physician assistant program, is all academic in the Metro Atlantic. So she'll have a couple of more years at Quinnipiac and 
She'll still be close to Paul and Tricia as that goes down for the floor. Oh, she's Her, got the look of a coach. Yeah, man. She, and Tricia told us that she could be a coach. And if she wants to be down the line, she's all right with having that door open. But she switched from coach to mom very quickly as Nafisa Collier hits a long two. Went from saying, hey, she could be a coach down the line, but hey, she's got to finish school first. She has to finish school first. So <laughs> just cool to hear the juxtaposition of mom and coach, daughter and player. And Quinnipiac has had a very special player in Carly Fabu. Stroud Manet with another field goal. Defense in traffic. She has just gotten better and better and more acclimated as the season has gone on. Vay misses the three. Ooh, nice dish. Dangerfield to Collier. Another assist. See Quinnipiac struggling from three point range tonight. And there's Kia Nurse on the defensive end, making it difficult. Collier comes over to tie up McClure. Quinnipiac ball on the possession. Of An excellent defensive play by Kia Nurse. Yep. Got to blow up that handoff. Not let that exchange happen to get in. Get her hand in there and have a little bit of a deflection. In between Williams and Nurse. What a defensive tandem. The two seniors that Kara talked about in our open. Thornton. Unable to get the bounce. And that'll take us to the end of the third quarter. At the end of three quarters, you've got 54. In their home building. 145 and 2. Quinnipiac foul. We'll go against Darren McClure. Gabby Williams starts the fourth of the bench. Samuelson. That is just her fifth shot of the game, and she's knocked out three of those attempts. Megan Walker, the freshman, is out there for the UConn. And the journey to the Frozen Four in St. Paul continues Saturday with a triple header of regional semis and regional finals. Puck drop at 3.30 on ESPNU. It concludes on ESPN2 at 9 o'clock Eastern time. And check out your matchups at NCAA.com, the home for all 90 NCAA championships. And of course, every game available on the ESPN app. UConn ball. It's an opportunity for Gino Arama to get Megan Walker some minutes with his regular rotation. And UConn in big games has been a six-player team. Azari Stevens off the bench, and really the only player getting meaningful minutes. And this is an opportunity for the young freshman to get some with the regulars. Foul on Quinnipiac here. Walker, the number one player out of high school, really had trouble finding time in the rotation. Had a really good stretch in January where it looked like she was starting to figure things out. Had a bit of a rocky stretch against some top 25 teams when she did get to play minutes. We saw her anchor the bench in the first round for UConn. Traveling violation here, though. Obviously, with this game 
at a 26 point margin. You wonder how long some of these starters are going to be in as Paige Werfel gets a bucket against UConn. Gino Ariema did not have to play a single starter in the fourth quarter on Saturday. And we're going to find out as the night goes on who UConn will play in the Sweet 16, assuming that they're able to hold on to this lead. Things are getting interesting in the second round. Duke is up 21 on Georgia at halftime. And then we've got two double-digit seeds giving some run on the road as well. Central Michigan up 13 at halftime on Ohio State. Buffalo up double digits in the third quarter on Florida State in Tallahassee. Those are two red teams, yep. two Mid-American Conference teams. That's right. Getting it done. Good pass by Williams to Collier. Brittany Martin. Feels like Gino Ariema really wants to see his sets run cleanly. But it's interesting how different the two games have been yeah. in terms of style. The first game, St. Francis wanted to play a quick pace, was willing to get up and down the entire game with Connecticut. And in this game, Quinnipiac chose to try and limit possessions as much as possible. The result is the same. Yeah. A dominant performance by the UConn Huskies. The margin different, and the number of points on the board different. Faye with a nice little bounce there. Redshirt Jr. out of Lindbrook, New York. My record player. A tremendous personality, unreal athleticism, arguably the most athletic player we have in college basketball. And I remember watching the Tournament Challenge Marathon and hearing Jay Billis say, Gabby Williams is the most complete player, men's or women's, in college hoops. So because Jay said it, now it's true? I don't know if it's true, but <laughs> I think there's a lot of evidence to support that fact. Yes. <laughs> to support that statement. I mean, an incredible career that she's put together, the excellent run. And will be an integral part if UConn is to make another championship run. She's been such a unique player. I think when you look back at the different players in this program, you see Gabby Williams, one of two players with 1,500 points, 900 rebounds, and 300 steals in UConn history. And she's been somebody, along with Maya Moore, who's the other player that, that hit those marks. She's been somebody that has been able to make her mark on the defensive end of the yep. floor. And if you think back of all the great players in UConn's history, very few of them, the best part of their game was the, the defensive defense, end. Right? Not that they weren't competent defensive players, some of them, but, you know, you, that was the best part of their game. And, and that's what I've loved about watching Gabby is that that is the best part of her game. She's been an improving offensive player from freshman year to, to senior year. She's improved a ton. But to make her mark in a program that's had so many great players and do it in a different way. Yeah. You know how hard that is? Because you're always going to be compared to those names. A legal screen called. I'll go against Gabby Williams. You're always going to compare most players to the numbers, right? Yep. In this particular program, what did Brianna Stewart do? What did Maya Moore do? You're typically going to look at players like that who made major impacts towards the top of the offensive statistical charts. Not to say that Gabby Williams hasn't done that, but... Tell me any player in the country who would choose her as their defensive assignment. She's the center, and she's led UConn in assists the last two seasons. That's center. And she's center being shorter than a couple of her teammates that she starts alongside. 5'11". Yeah. She's taking the jump ball instead of a person Nafisa. like Nafisa Collier, who's 6'1". Or even a Katie Lou Samuelson, a guard, who's 6'3".
Martin's off target. Quinnipiac down by 27. Williams taps it out. Saved by Collier to Walker. It all came from the Gabby Williams athleticism. And she'll get the assist to Collier. Piece of Collier with back to back 20 plus point games. Inside of five to play. It'll stay at this end of the floor. Quinnipiac's 23 game win streak is going to come to an end tonight. The third longest streak in the country active right now. What a year. They challenge themselves with a tough schedule and reacted very well to the point where they could have potentially picked up an at-large bid if they lost in the MAC tournament. That's where you want to build your program. I think so. I mean, they're three and four against teams in the field. And that speaks to Trisha Fabry and how she was willing to challenge her team in the non-conference, knew what type of team she had. And you look at the the hurdles and the steps that this Quinnipiac program has made over the last couple seasons. Win their first two tournament games a season ago, win their third game this year. It's become an expectation to win when they get in a tournament, and, and that's the bar that needs to be crossed for Quinnipiac. That's yeah. when you're a program, is when you expect to make the NCAA tournament, regardless of whether you win your conference tournament. If Trisha Fabry keeps scheduling like this in the non-conference and they're able to win games I think that's that could be a reality for this team coming up tonight on Sports Center with Scott Van Pelt after Warriors Spurs Tyron Lou health issues Larry Drew is going to take over and how does this affect the Cavs another issue that they have to deal with if you're worried about the Warriors with all their injuries well is that going to derail, uh, derail their reign on the championship and Penny taking over at Memphis. The former Tiger himself is the new men's basketball coach. Shout out to Little Penny. Little Penny. You and I spent an, an impressive amount of time going back and watching Little Penny commercials earlier today. <laughs> Probably a little too much Probably time. Probably a little bit too much time <laughs> watching Little Penny commercials earlier today. <laughs> Here's Thornton. A little bit short. Tyler Irwin went off the bench. Molly Bent is going to check in. And Katie Lou Samuelson is done. Also in a foul call. Number four, Stroman. Or personal foul, Stevens to the free throw line. A potential Duke Yukon Sweet 16 matchup in Albany with Azare Stevens potentially going up against her former team and former coach. And this is Azare Stevens' first year playing for the UConn Huskies, sat out last season due to that transfer, spent her first two years as a member of the Duke Blue Devils. UConn sub number 32, Patrulli Kamara, for number 23, Azale Stevens. 14 points and three blocks tonight for Stevens. Fabric. Potentially the final shot that she takes in a Bobcat uniform.
Good defense by McClure. Foul against UConn. Four subs waiting at the scorer's table for the Bobcats. And that's it for Carly Fabry. Oh, not yet. They're going to they're gonna keep her on the floor for now. They're going to let her come off the floor by herself. There's a guy, Paul. Kia Nurse comes off the floor for UConn. The final time in front of the Gamble Pavilion crowd. Wonder what's going through Carly Fabry's head right now. The shot won't go for Cara Bikini. And there is a foul. Brittany Martin is waiting at the scorer's table. What a career for Carly Fabry. She helped establish this program into what it is now. She sure did. You think back to, she's three years old and she's going to her mom's basketball camps. She's riding the bus, sitting in the back with the players when she's in elementary school and middle school. 19 years of her life yeah. built into this program. Absolutely. Carly Irvin with the two. Carly Fabry may or may not have had a Sue Bird jersey as a kid growing up. But eventually, it became a family affair. Paul is watching his daughter sit her final minutes of her career. That's what this tournament is all about. We're going to crown a champion in a couple of weekends in Columbus, Ohio. We've seen upsets already. We've seen the Davids beat the Goliaths, so to speak. But that emotion that you just watched over the last couple of minutes, that's what these weekends are all about. Final minute. Taylor Hurd. And a foul called. Patuli Kamara down low, battling. People's range. Not mine, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, I guess we're going to have to find out, huh? <laughs> Most songs are out of my range, sadly. <laughs> Almost every song is out of my range. Danielle Bradley, the freshman out of Pickerington, Ohio, at the free throw line for Quinnipiac. Two seniors, two juniors on the left side of your screen. Collier and Samuelson coming back next season as well. You did forget that I travel with my own karaoke. Well, yeah, I don't want to. I mean, 
you, you got you, that's just that's just ballers, man. But that's what that is. Here's Hurd. Rebounded by Lexi Gordon. Their season comes to a close. And for the Yukon Huskies, a quarter cent.